So Laura, thank you again for being here and uh, to talk to me. Uh, I I want to start uh, asking you why did you decide to write for a young adult audience? I think there's part of me that's still a teenager, <laughs> and I used to teach school, and I love. Um, I have two teenagers at home, and I just love that age. I love the coming of age type of storytelling where. Uh, concerning teens and where they're going after they graduate and off to uh, college or getting a job or all those things when they when they leave school or high school or whatever um yeah so I I'm very interested in that age and I love that type of storytelling and the readers are so fun and sweet and, and lovely so right now um I'm enjoying working in young adults and I might do adult in the future, but right now I'm so busy doing young adult. I don't really have time. <laughs> so. Yeah. And uh, at teens, you'll be the first to discard any media that uh, try to look like an adult uh, doing their best to sound like a child. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, what's your it's secret? Hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult, right? And what's your secret to talk to them and uh, getting their attention through your books? Well, there's a thing that um, young adults are capable of understanding beautiful language and tough themes. And so the difference in writing for young adults and adult is not really always about how you say things. It's point of view. And it's where the characters are centered and how and their their uh, place in the world so it's not like any type of making your language sound more simple sometimes mm -hmm. we're not as lyrical or as um we we might explain a little more or things are maybe more current or you know or quicker um mm -hmm. but there's not like oh this is for kids and this is for adults and this is like lesser or it's less layered that's not true at all it's really, and I think that's a common um, fallacy, a common misconception that some readers have about kid lit or young adult, that it's lesser or it's not as complicated. It's not true at all. Mm -hmm. Just point of view. And do you have a lot of uh, adult readers also? Yes, I do. Even within kid lit, within young adult, there are age groups or kind of specializations that we gravitate toward mine le uh, reads older it's just what I like my characters are usually in the you know between 17 and 19 not as much as the 14 15 and we need all of that we need the for the young adult for a 14 year old protagonist or 15 year olds and we need the 18 year olds I just love writing in that that upper space and so and I have kind of a um a layered form of writing, lyrical, a little, a little deeper. And um, my stories might be a little longer. So a lot of adults do love to read them too. Many of my readers are adults and they buy it or their teens buy it and read it too, or vice versa. Yeah. And uh, how is your relationship with your readers, your fans? They're the best. There's nothing <laughs> I love more than, especially now I, first, I got to go to my first live event in a while or two and I got to, to sign books again and hug mm -hmm. my fans and and um, be with them safely mm -hmm. and it was the best just like I love them so much and I get dms or emails on my website from young readers that are like I love that <laughs> we have a Cuban girl I'm Cuban too or I'm Cuban American or I'm half and I like Lila and I you know, was struggling with my identity and they send the cutest notes and they make me things too. Mm -hmm. um, fan art, they knit, they send me gifts. It's the best. So it's one of my favorite <laughs> things. I love my readers. I love you readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and like you said, uh, you are a Cuban American, right? Yes. And in the book, A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea and Tomorrow, as the, the name implies, tells the story of a, a, a girl uh, who knows the importance of the, her regions and values her feminine very much. So we can say that this is your most personal book. How much By of Leila uh, is, is Laura? Most of her. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm probably not as 
you know, she, Lila at the beginning of the book is really, really obstinate and she's bossing everybody around and she thinks she knows everything. I wasn't unlike that as a teen. <laughs> Maybe she's a more extreme version of me, but as far as um, knowing exactly, thinking that I had to have everything planned out at 18 and then like there was only one way. And if there was something that changed, then that was automatically bad. That is very much like me. And some of the relationships that Leela has, uh, the one she's getting over and the one she develops are very much like mine at her age. So um, it was really hard. And also it was cathartic, but also really emotional. I didn't expect it going back to my own um, teenage years and relying on that, that, you know, it took a lot out of me. And I think that I think it was a good thing to do. And I'm glad I did it. Yeah. And you told me that the second book the continuum of the yeah. story, the sequence, uh, is ready. Yes. What yes, do your readers out. Out. Yes. Yeah. Next what year. Your readers can year. expect? Okay. So this one is not a sequel means it would be Leela's story again, but it's not Leela's story. Mm. It's three mm -hmm. years later. And Leela is very much in the book, like a lot, but it's Flora's story. And Flora is Orion's sister. And in Cuban Girl, she's 15. And in her book, she gets her own book three years later because and it'll come out exactly three years after Cuban Girl. So 2020 and 2023. So she's 18 and she does the reverse. Flora goes to Miami. So, and the I just revealed the title on all my social media today. It's called A British Girl's Guide to Hurricanes and Heartbreak. And Lila and Orion are in it and Flora and all the friends, the whole gang, but it's the opposite of Lila's story. So Lila goes from Miami to England. Flora goes from England to Miami. And um, you'll see, just watch my social media because I'm going to be teasing what the premise is and what happens to Flora and some of the tropes. Like, we have some fun things going on. Yeah. So. Yeah. I guess your fans will be excited about it. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and did you expect your books to be so successful? Uh, the Cuban Girls Guide to Teen Tomorrow uh, is the only one that you have here published in Brazil by the Alta Novel Publisher. Uh, uh, and the entry to the publishing news bestseller list shortly after its release. And this doesn't happen often. So it's a, it's a good thing to know that your books are selling very well here in Brazil. Did you expect that your books will be so sec successful? Well, I, I'm so grateful. Thank you, Brazil. I, I, know, <laughs> I love my Brazilian readers. And I, I have to say, before I answer your question, I have gotten so many messages and little memes and videos on TikTok from Brazilian readers. And you are mm. all the best. I, you're the sweetest funniest most lovely lovely group of readers and I'm so happy to have my book in your hands I'm so honored and I just want to thank you for all the love that you've shown me I truly appreciate it and I, I think about you and I talk about you to my editors my agents are like oh, Brazilian readers they're the best they're my favorite you know so um I really do thank you so you know when we start writing things we always wish that people would love our work and then of course it would sell and and get all these good things sure we all wish for that but it's kind of like you don't want to hope too much for yourself as you're going because your expectations sometimes can be too high and then you get let down so I try to manage that by just putting out the best work that I can that I truly love and being able to do that and that people you know go to a store and pick up my work that I put my heart in as I really do um, my entire self is really what I do this for. So, and if it is a success, we love it. I love it. Thank you. But I'm just happy to do this. And uh, in your books, you often address some of the trauma that young girls face at that age. Uh, is that a, one of your secrets? As one of my secrets. Um, yeah, because you yeah. you sh usually talk about our traumas and the things that the teenagers are, are going through. You know, yeah. this is the it's, it's a way to connect with them, right? Yes, I think so. It's a way um, because a lot of like Lila has a hard, a hard year. Three bad things happen to her all at once, and teenagers some um, will have that kind of year or worse. So. I want to write 
um, those stories where grief is explored and honored, but also there's a path through and there's hope. And I'm really attracted to that type of storytelling because I think it's emotional, it's relevant. And then also including, um, including humor and those things and how those, um, those things all are not separate, that there are moments of, of joy and all of that, you know, within even grie- grieving, you're still, sometimes you're grieving and then you're going to have happy memories mixed in with that. And just what does that look like? Um, that's very exciting to me to write about and interesting. Yeah, and you have two teenagers in your house, right? And how I do. they, yeah, and how they inspire you every day. Well, they tell me when I write something that is not what teens say anymore. <laughs> They're the first, so I have them read in like nobody talks like that anymore. No way he does that. Or I ask them like, um, in my book that just came out, um, I don't know if you, when we were them, that was my, actually my latest book. There's a prank scene. Like they prank, they, they uh, get back at somebody. And I asked them, okay, if someone did this to you, how would you retaliate or get back? Or what's something silly you would do? And they gave me some ideas. So they are involved in that way. And they are great um, consult, uh, consultors. And uh, yeah, and they, they're the first to tell me when I mess something up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you already uh, received some feedback that impressed you, that uh, was special for you in some way? On on which book? On on Cuban Girl, or oh, in or in, in all your books? Yeah. Oh in, goodness. Well, <laughs> I make I, I make the, re- the the question more yeah. more difficult in yeah. all your oh, books. Oh, it is. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when Reese Witherspoon co- picks you for her book club, that was one of the best days of my life. So once, because I really like her, I've always loved her as an actress and all her movies were some of my favorites. And my daughter and I would watch Legally Blonde when she was growing up all the time. And we would love that. And then for her to write me and, and, and tell me that something that I made was something that she loved was one of the coolest things. When somebody that you admire then admire something of yours great day so that was really special um and just I think when readers tell me that they hadn't seen themselves in a story the same way and that my book helped them navigate a hard time or a a change and that they show me at signings they bring the book and it's like tattered and they've they've written in it and they put notes and they draw and they highlight and they show me these things or they text me or, or DM me a picture of this. That is just, it's so wonderful because writing a lot of the time it's between me and a computer screen yeah. and you don't see the end result. I mean, you read reviews, you read, you know, you see people talking about it online or on, on TikTok or something like that. But to have someone say something you made changed this part of my life and it's helping me it's such a reward like it makes the circle close um from the time that it's just the paper yeah yeah this is certainly special yeah uh and sales of young adult books have been growing in recent years uh what is that in your opinion um what is the reason for this I think young adult books now are becoming more diverse. We're seeing more own voices stories with um, BIPOC. You know, we have Brazilian protagonists and Cuban and Mexican and Black. Wonderful stories just centering these stories that are not necessarily about the any kind of pain or immigrant experience, but just, uh, just Latina characters as star- starring in their own stories, in mystery novels, in romances, not about immigration or about anything, you know, persecution, just living and showing their cultures and then putting those into rom-coms and, and all kinds of things with the food and music and all the beautiful things. I think those are, we ha- still have work to do don't um, to get more of these books out there. But I think those stories are coming out more in that, attracts people want to buy those they want to learn about other cultures and experience them and so they're selling and also um young adult books are expanding there are a lot more imprints which are the divisions of publishing that are uh putting them out and adults are liking them now they're saying oh these are really good books these are exciting 
you know, we all loved the Hunger Games and Twilight and all those. And adults were, you know, I was a young, I was a mother before I started writing, reading all of those too. So we love just good storytelling. And I think that's happening in YA right now. And uh, generally, uh, young adult books are writing by women, right? Um, which is a different statistic from the other literary categories. And even looking at the big, big bestseller lists, which are mostly occupy, occupied by male authors, right? Uh, we, all, we usually see that. Uh, have you ever suffered prejudice or felt that your path would be more difficult as a female writer? I have uh, had female editors. Uh, so I think more, um, I don't know if I have, and because I don't see what happens behind there, if they're like barely picking me because I might be human American or a woman or identify as female. I, I don't know. I do know sometimes we get, we get paid less that male writers is a, um, our, their advances are bigger. And that's something that we're fighting. Like, Hey, we're good too. Hello, you know, we're here and it's only totally changing, but it's not there because that, there was a study that came out and people were putting what they made, you know, on their books or advances. And like the men were making all this money and I'm like, Hmm. So it's not true for everybody. And there's not like these blanket statements. Some people's experiences are diverse. They're subjective and it's hard to know be beyond just my experience and maybe my closest writer friends. Um, I would say I had more issue with, um, the, and this is, is changing now with writing a story about a Cuban American being Cuban American, that a lot of um, some of the white publishing gatekeepers didn't always understand what I was doing in the story and said that my experience maybe wasn't believable. And that's where, that was really hard for me because it's hard to, to um, ingest that something that actually happened to you. Like Leela's story is based on my childhood. Um, my cousins came to stay with me when they were having, that's what you do. And, you know, if you're having a, you're having a hard time, your mommy sends you away to a Thea. <laughs> <laughs> and he and and they could not fathom that like they would not do that and like that is so common in Latina culture, and they said it's unbelievable you know and so I did work to strengthen how I explained that, but it didn't mean that it was unreal and it shouldn't be shown because it's not palatable. Um, so I think these things go together that our experiences as women as Latina creators as Cuban Americans as Brazilians, all of these things matter. And there's not one way that things should be. We have diverse experiences and, and they should be told authentically and not sugarcoated and not whitewashed. Um, we're still fighting that. And I'm mm -hmm. blessed and lucky to be published, to be one of the ones who fought through that, found a wonderful publisher and editor who championed me and kept and wanted the integrity of my story to stay the way it was. And I got such good response. And people are like, finally, someone's talking about this. Or finally, we see a girl on the cover with hair like this. You know, Lula, mm -hmm. if you look on the cover of Cuban World, this is a, <laughs> you know, or to, you know, all of the things like a Cuban girl on a cover, a Latina team, not, you know, not playing the side character or one that walks in the room or a token, but the, but the star. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, I'm so glad you brought that up because as women, I'm still fighting it as a Latina woman, as a Latina, I'm still fighting it as a creator, um, as a young adult author, as an advocate for teens, I'm fighting it, you know, and all I, I fight it with my words. I just keep going I keep writing. Yeah. yeah and I, and I've asked you about, um, your relationship with your readers. And I want to know your relationship with your publisher and your editors, because oh, as, yeah. I, yeah, and because as you say, uh, as you said, um, it sounds good, right? They're wonderful. My uh, the editor for Cuban Girl. This is really cute. Um, Lila in the story is a baker, and she goes obviously to England and meets Ryan, her partner. Well, that happened. <laughs> that was my editor's experience. She in college. Is she is Cuban American? She went to England to study and met her fiance. 
Really? And she loves to bake. And so when she saw Leela, she said, oh, it's me. <laughs> and she fell in love with that and then was so helpful. And it was so much fun. Um, she's so lovely. And she had also has done my other books and she edited um, Flora's book recently. She's She really understands me. Uh, I feel like she understands the way I say things and she helps me say them better. And so I there's a high trust level because she's so brilliant. She will pull and push me where I don't think I need to go. But then I go there and I realize, oh, you are so right. And then when she does say something, I listen because she's rarely kind of off. It's just very few times where I haven't done exactly what she said, but most times she's, she's so right. And so I, um, we all need that as creators because we get so into our stories and our heads and we need people to check us and to make sure that we are telling the best that we can in the best way so yeah I love them they're great uh, and I ask you this because when you um, talk with a young adult audience sometimes we need to be creative to get their attention and this kind of idea has to come from the publishers too right how do you two uh, work together with uh, some different different ideas um, a lot of the time it's just the marketing we put out um, videos or games um i do a lot on social media if you're out there please follow me and you can always message me and i will respond if you have a question or you want to say something or you just you know say hi i will i love to respond and chat with you you're never bothering me <laughs> uh, we just try to find connection points we do they do these silly videos you can see them on youtube um would you rather i don't know if you know that game uh they ask me questions like would you rather Go on a yes. motorcycle or a bus, you know, and they have put those and their, their goal is to make me look completely silly and, and to have fun because I think teens love to laugh. We, you know, they love to be silly and they love fun things and we love to have fun that we're not just stuck on a computer or boring people that we are goofy too and we can, you know, hang with them and, um, and listen. And so I think finding those connection points is what I do, what the publisher kind of helps me do. Um, and we don't, we're not trying to be teens. I'm not on there trying to be 17. I'm just trying to be a listener and a friend and someone that they can ask. I get a girl wrote to me about a breakup with a boyfriend after reading and she asked my advice. Like I was an advice column in a magazine. Just, well, you wrote this. What should I do? And I thought that was so adorable. <laughs> you know, she's like, well, you know, you're old. <laughs> No, but it's fun to to be close to to your readers, right? Oh, uh, it, I, it's and I, mean, I guess I it's fun for them, them and it's fun for you at the same time. It's so much fun because, I mean, I've had girls, you know, girls crying that they were going through a friend breakup. Like in when we were that, my latest book is about friend friendship breakup, and she said that she was going through the same thing. She could barely talk. She's just crying and. I felt that because I remember we like to be 16 and 17 and, and your friends are your world. And um, so, you know, remembering all of that and trying to put it in a book in an authentic way, but also I'm a little bit older adding the, the way, because you can't always see a way out when you're 16, but you can when you're my age, usually because you've, you've lived it, you've lived a few heartbreaks. So we try to add those things, but in a way that are as palatable and exciting and interesting to teens. That's how we connect. Uh, and how is your process of writing? Uh, how long did you did, did you take to to write a book? Um, here's the yeah. Uh, everyone has their own process. Mine is kind of a mess, but I have learned that that's okay. Um, I'm I don't outline books, but I always know uh, so much about the characters, and I know the beginning, I know like the middle, and I know the last page. What happens? So I write to these points, but what happens in between, I always leave open because some for inspiration. So that, uh, that makes me kind of a slow drafter. Like the first drafts take me longer than maybe some people, but then um, they're good drafts because I kind of work through them and, and take my time. So my revision process is usually a little bit easier and quicker. So I'm a slow drafter and a fast reviser. And if you don't know about publishing, we go through hundreds and hundreds of drafts and revisions by the time it gets to the shelf. 
that it's sometimes I will edit a pack passage uh, 500 times. That is normal, like one. Um, it takes about a year for me to put to a book together between drafting and all the revisions, sometimes more. It's almost like whatever your drafting time is, you double that for revision a lot of the time. And then there's rounds of edits, copy edits, where they're checking your grammar and make sure that you, you know, you didn't spell something wrong or have the right information about a place or whatever you're doing, like fact checkers, all of that. You have to do go through all those rounds and different people get a hold of it and help you. So that's comforting to me because then I can just work and then and and have the help then to um to help me make it my best. So it's not just me. <laughs> Andy, you'll never come to Brazil, right? I am not, and I'm dying to come to Brazil. Yeah, isn't I, your plan? I, oh, yes. And if I do, I will. T I will tell you when I'm there. When maybe you know, I can meet you, and we can do some things. I want to try all the food. I'm a huge foodie, as you can tell. All my books have food. I want to eat everything. <laughs> I want to go everywhere. So and so does my husband, and probably my my kids do too. So hey, Brazil, I'm coming for you. Get ready. Yeah, I'm come, coming. please. We, okay. We, we... I would love pleasure to, to receive you. <laughs> and uh, what advice would you give to uh, uh, authors that are starting right now? How was your Ian, How was your beginning? Um, the single best thing you can do to be a writer is to be a reader and to read everything. And I'm talking 50 books at least before you start in the genre and age group you want to write. See what others are doing recognize how they're doing well and see if you can emulate that not copy it but emulate it and what I like to do then um, is from those 50 books pick like the top three why are those top three your top three see if you can go in and and dissect what the author is doing is it their voice it, is it their prose that makes you really want to read it because it's exciting and uh is it the characters Is it the plot plus the characters? What did they do differently than those other books? And write, get a journal, start writing those things. Um, that will help you more than anything because that's the way the brain works. The brain will internalize good things and it will become part of your psyche, part of your process of consciously. And that will change your work for the better. Yeah, it's so it's kind of a, 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 a different, uh, a huge study, right? You need yeah, to study. And, and you need to put in the time. Just like to be a lawyer, you've got to go to school for three, you know, years. To be a doctor, you have to go to school for years, years, and years. To be a writer, I mean, some people are just natural. They 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 pick up a pen and it's perfect. I mean, rarely, not me. I work. Um, improve your craft. Go to classes. Um, listen to music and poetry because the rhythm of those things can help you with the way that you express yourself. And yeah, so emulate the best. And then my, this is really hard. As soon as you have something it, to just write freely. And as soon as you have something, share it with someone else, get their opinion, get used to getting in a writer's group where you write a small thing and share it and get feedback and learn, get used to opening up your heart. Because if you're going to be an author, you're going to write something and it's just you and the computer, but that doesn't last for long. Millions of people are going to be able to walk into a bookstore, pick up that book and take it home. And they're reading and it's terrifying at first to because that vulnerability. So as soon as you can, as soon as you're able, start sharing the work and get comfortable with criticism, get comfortable with feedback. The hard things, the hard things will make you better. And, yeah. and try to get over the pride, you know, like I did it right. This is right, you know, I did it my way. That's not going to get you anywhere. Um, You have to earn that. I, you know, we have to earn those things. The way, the ability to say, no, I'm doing it this way is earned and comes through so much learning and growing that we're still doing. Yeah. And I guess deal with uh, criticism is one of the hardest part, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And another advice now for teenagers that might be going through tough times, what would you say? Yeah. Two things. Find your squad, open up to your friends, your family, the people that you are trusted and don't hold back from that. Talk about it. Um, is there therapy? 
that's always something I recommend get help or you know just really just open up to your friends get their opinions and another thing is just honor the grief go through it feel it feel your feelings feel your feelings um if you keep trying to suppress things and trying to be strong and <laughs> I'm fine doing all those things is okay you know temporarily but really allow yourself to grieve and to honor the emotion and what it means for your life right now because it's temporary it's not going to last forever you should many most things will pass so giving it the time to run through your body run through your mind run through your heart and just be and honor it is something that i model in my books and when the characters don't do that they face trouble and it gets worse but when they get honest with themselves and they just honor that grief and say you're important now you you're not something to avoid you're something to teach me something and something that's going to make me stronger it's going to make me a better friend or whatever um and you can't see that when you're in the middle of it it's terrible but just know that um suppressing it is not going to help you but honor it because when you honor that grief and you you literally sit with it and you spend time with it and inside of it if you do that daily you'll find that one day you will wake up and you need to because you will have done it and it will have run away and it's, and it's it's always there but it's not going to take over you're going to be able to go forward so that's what i tell yeah. teens yeah that was a uh, really good advice i will use it thank you too. <laughs> good i yeah yeah we all need it <laughs> we all need it yeah um laura thank you so much i i can say personally that i'm uh anxious to your next book i want to read it uh and thank you again for this conversation you are such a nice person i i love it to talk to you and i hope to thank see you, you soon in brazil I hope that too. And yeah. Besos, Brasil. Besos. Thank you again, Laura. This conversation was uh, really good. Uh, there's something that I, I didn't ask you and you like to talk. Sure. Oh, oh goodness. I, I think you, you got most of the main things. I just want to say again how lovely um, Alta has been and making the beautiful things for readers, how excited they've been and how that has just made my day so many times opening up that so um again uh you are so valued to me so important to me and i'm so glad that you have your own translation that you can enjoy lila's story and yeah i would and i would love to meet as many of you as i can thank you so much thank you laura thank you again thank you beijos <laughs> Beijos. Beijos. See you.